more pancakes. So like I mentioned when we first started talking about pancakes, usually when you're making a recipe, you have more than enough of lots of the ingredients. Sometimes you have more than enough of everything. But I've had, you know, sleepovers with my older boys, and, you know, they want pancakes for breakfast. So you make pancakes from scratch. And here you've got, like, you know, six, 17-year-old football players. They eat a lot of pancakes, right? So one recipe of pancakes is not going to cut it. So you make multiple <laughs> recipes of pancakes, and then you realize, oh, wait a minute, we don't have enough buttermilk. And so you have to go to the store and get buttermilk, or we don't have enough eggs. There's often something you run out of, right? That is the ingredient that limits how much you could make. Because you might be willing to stand there and make pancakes all day long, but if you run out of an ingredient, you can't. So suppose that we have on hand three cups of flour, 10 eggs, and four teaspoons of baking powder. How many pancakes can we make? 15. Okay, how did you do that? Because if you follow the formula, you're going to run out of cups of flour, but you're still going to have eggs in. If you follow the recipe, you're going to run out of cups of flour, and you're going to have eggs and teaspoons of baking soda, baking powder left. Okay, can you prove that to me? How about if we do a little calculation like we learned on Tuesday, and say, well, what if we have three cups of flour? How many pancakes could we make? Three cups of flour. So we get five pancakes. I'm going to call them PC because I'm tired of writing pancakes. We get five pancakes for every one cup of flour, right? And so that tells us we could make... 15 pancakes. Well, 10 eggs. How many pancakes? If we had lots of everything else. Well, we get five pancakes for how many eggs? For every two eggs. Eggs cancel out. So that gives us 25, right? So if we had plenty of flour and that many eggs, we could make 25 pancakes. <coughs> um, I didn't leave enough space. We've got four tisps of baking powder. We make five pancakes for each half teaspoon, so 0.5. Um, so I think that's 40, 40 pancakes. Everybody okay with those calculations? Why can't we make 40 pancakes? We've got enough baking powder. We don't have enough flour or eggs. And so what we did here, which a lot of us understood just thinking about it without writing all this junk down, what we think about is, well, how many, how much product could we make if we used all of this up? How much if we used all of that one up? How much here? And whichever one is smaller is the answer, right? Because as we're going along making pancakes, you know, we make five pancakes, ten pancakes, a third recipe, fifteen pancakes, we have to stop because we ran out of flour. We can't do any more. Any questions? So here's pictures. <coughs> that many cups of flour, we can figure out how many pancakes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, what if when we're cooking pancakes, we, we burned three of them because, you know, the phone rang and the cat needed to go in and you had to use the bathroom and you weren't paying attention. And one fell on the floor and it's, it's my house and the floor hasn't been mopped for a while and so we're not going to eat the pancake off the floor. So 
we had enough stuff to make 15 pancakes, but how, do we act how many do we actually end up with? 11. So in theory, we could have made 15, but stuff happened, and so we only actually got 11. So the 11 in chemistry talk would be considered our actual yield, how many we actually made. The 15 is our theoretical yield because in theory, if everything went perfectly, we could make 15. How often does everything go perfectly? Never. Okay, any questions? Well, sometimes we express this as a percent yield. <coughs> Do you remember what I told you was the, the generic equation for percent? Well, very generically, it's the part over the whole times 100. And so here, the whole would be the most we could make the theoretical, and the part is what we actually did. So we were, you know, 73% successful in making our pancakes. Another way to express that is that it's the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield. I call him Theo because his name's too long, times 100. So we got 73% of our theoretical yield. Now, if you were maybe making pancakes for a big fundraiser, and you had people pre-order, and you're charging them extra to make money, right? You want to make sure that you have enough pancakes to fill all the order. And so maybe you know from experience that stuff happens with the pancakes. And so if you want to make, make sure that you have 500 pancakes, you better start out making more, right? But you don't want to make too many more because then you're going to waste all that money on ingredients for pancakes that you haven't sold. And so this percentage can help us to figure out how much extra do we have to plan for so that when pancakes burn and get dropped on the floor or maybe the cat gets one of them, you know, stuff happens that we'll, we'll still come out with the right number. So, the, the actual yield of a chemical reaction has to be determined experimentally. <coughs> and it's going to depend on the conditions, just like the percent yield of pancakes would depend on conditions. If you've got a house full of teenage boys and they're playing Smash Brothers and they're having a Nerf war at the same time in the kitchen, you know, your percent yield might be lower than if you were all by yourself and able to focus on the pancakes, right? So the actual yield depends on conditions. And in homework problems and test problems, you're not actually doing the experiment, right? So we're going to tell you what the actual yield is. Now in lab, the actual yield is what you get. Today, you're doing an experiment, some of you did it on, on Tuesday, where you come up with a yield at the end. That is your actual yield. The theoretical yield is calculated using stoichiometry. And what we'll find is that the actual yield is almost always less than 100%, because things never go perfectly. Two, two common things that happen, some of the product doesn't form. It just doesn't, doesn't form. Most chemical reactions don't go all the way to completion. And that's a topic for another class. Product is lost in the process of recovering it. And you'll see that in lab. It's like, well, I was supposed to get all of this precipitate into the funnel, but I can't get this stuff out of the beaker. Well, you just lost some of your product. It happens. We're not going to get upset about it. But that's why the percent yield is usually less than 100. Now, sometimes it does come out higher than 100. Is it possible to get more than 100% yield? How can you make more than you could make? 
when, when we get a percent yield that's greater than 100%, that means that we have some kind of a problem. If you're weighing a precipitate, usually it's come out of a solution and it was wet. If you don't let it dry completely, then you're going to have the mass of the water that's making it wet included in the mass of your product, which makes it seem heavier than it actually is. And so you could get a higher than 100% yield. Um, one of my favorite stories, when I was in, in college, we were doing an experiment, and it was a long, involved experiment. And at the very end, we had our samples in a crucible, and we were burning off the filter paper. It's very important. And this was in an old building that had windows that opened and no screens, and so there were flies. And one of my fellow students, a fly flew across, and the heat from the flame caused it to fall into his crucible and burn up. Right? How does that even happen? It's like, oh, now what? Because he had his sample in there, but he's also going to have the mass of a burned up fly. And that's going to cause his percent yield to be higher than it should be, right? So this guy was thinking. He's like, well, there's no time to go do this over. So he went around the building and he caught 10 flies. And he ashed them, he burned them, and found the average mass of an ashed housefly and subtracted that off. OK? That's, that's good thinking. <coughs> I think it did work. I think it did. OK? So to summarize. The limiting reactant in, in when we're cooking, we think about ingredients. It's sometimes called the limiting reagent. That's the one that gets used up. It's called the limiting reactant because it is the reactant that limits the amount of product. Theoretical yield is how much you could make in theory if everything worked out perfectly. That's something you calculate using stoichiometry. The actual yield is how much you actually make, okay? real life included. Then the percent yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. And of course, you know, we would like that to be close to 100, but it's not always going to happen that way. <coughs> okay, so we can do this with chemicals. So here's a simple equation, titanium and chlorine reacting to form uh, TiCl4. What's the limiting reactant and what's the theoretical yield if we're starting with 1.8 moles of titanium and 3.2 moles of chlorine? Well, what we have to do is use stoichiometry to find the amount of product that can be made from each reactant. The same thing we did with the pancakes. So we're going to say, well, if, if I have 1.8 moles of titanium, how many moles of product can I make? One. Because this ratio is one to one. For every one mole of this, I make one mole of that. If I start out with 1.8 moles, I'll make 1.8 moles. Well, if I had 3.2 moles of chlorine, how much of this could I make? Well, that's maybe not as obvious. Let's write it out. 3.2 moles of chlorine, and we get one mole of product for every two moles of chlorine. So that's what, 1.6? 3.2 divided by 2? And from this, we could get 1.8 moles. Which is smaller, 1.6 or 1.8? 1.6. So we find the amount of product using each of the reactants that's given. And then the limiting reactant is the one that gives you the smaller yield. So which reactant gave us this number? It was this guy right here. That's our limiting reactant the one that gave us the smaller number. And then the theoretical yield equals that smaller yield. 
So that's this guy right here. That's the process. So this is um, a more simple example because it's just moles to moles, right? We can do it with grams to grams, but we're going to have longer equations. So I think that's, that's enough for today.